All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you all here uh, early Saturday morning, and uh, we had a marvelous time last night as uh, Dr. Denny Burke uh, spoke on the first part of this uh, focus on transgenderism and what the Bible uh, has to say about uh, maleness, femaleness, and, and how we should view this revolution that has kind of has spread across our country. And, and I think even the hope that we have that the saving grace of Christ, that he can redeem and he can uh, restore what is broken. And so it's important for us as his children uh, to, to be knowledgeable, to be thoughtful, um, to be faithful to the example of Christ as he spoke to broken people. And so uh, I thank uh, Denny for just the, the wonderful words. And boy, we had a great Q&A last night, I think, also. A lot of wonderful questions from y'all, and just to really kind of elevate some issues that needed to be addressed in a more pointed way, and so thank you for that. And you'll have another opportunity this morning to do likewise uh, following Andrew's uh, talk. You know, as we get started, let me just read um, a word of, of Scripture here, just to kind of place these words of hope before our mind. I'm reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8. For I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, not, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Amen? Amen. Would you join me in prayer as we just ask the Lord's sanctifying uh, blessing on this uh, time we share together. Father, we come again to you humbly as your children, sons and daughters who have been adopted into your family experiencing in a variety of different ways brokenness um, that you have healed and redeemed. And yet we also are, are those who speak words of redemption and of hope to our generation. God, would you, would you equip us further in this marvelous stewardship that we take the graces that we have come to know and cherish, uh, these marvelous words of life-giving scripture, these words of clarity, uh, this heavenly counsel that you have entrusted to us, this treasure, as Paul said to Timothy, and, and we, we take these cherished things and would speak them to our generation. Would you, uh, again, enable us to, um, to have a, a clearer way of thinking about this fundamental part of how you have made us as male and female. Be with our speaker, Andrew, as he uh, speaks to us on these important things and then the, the time of questions and answers that, that follows. So we would ask these things uh, in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and all God's people said, amen, amen. Now, as Andrew comes up here last night, I mentioned some articles that I'm going to put uh, post on the website. Um, and, and so I'm not going to go through those again, but just to remind those that maybe weren't with us last night, um, there are several articles that we uh, mentioned in the talk and the Q&A, and I think they might, you might find them helpful in bringing some clarity um, on some issues uh, that, that were discussed. Um, there was a question about the, uh, the what was it, the, um, the one gentleman who had been transgender, Andrew, that one gender uh, uh, man that uh, had... Uh, 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 detransitioned, and his name, the article I think you were referring to, at least one of them, research claiming sex change benefits is based on junk science. That's at least one of them by, I think his name is Walt Heyer. 
And the name is spelled H-E-Y-E-R, for those of you that wanted to know that. So Walt Heyer, H-E-Y-E-R, and this one was published on the Federalist magazine, so that's uh, going to be available for your book. So why don't you uh, join me in welcoming Andrew to the stage. Andrew? Great. Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone. And even better, it's great to be in Texas. I like to tell every Texan, I'm a non-Texan, I'm an Illinoisan by, by birth, but uh, I love Texas. I have so many friends who are from Texas, and uh, I feel like any time to, to go back to the land of liberty, which is what I call Texas, that's an opportunity I cannot pass up. But it's very good to be with you this morning, and I just want to kind of set a roadmap for what we're hoping to accomplish um, in my talk this morning. Uh, Denny last night gave kind of a masterful, kind of biblical theological analysis of how the transgender revolution is posing um, a great uh, set of challenges to biblical authority, um, how that's uh, challenging the culture. And so Denny's, Denny's message was 40,000 foot, what is this doing to us as Christians with the Bible and culture. And in my talk this morning, I want to talk about how we might evaluate gender dysphoria and transgenderism um, less through the grid of kind of the culture, culture war issues going on and more about what it means for individuals who are afflicted with gender dysphoria and how we might understand what this phenomenon means and how we might minister to people in these types of circumstances. And most importantly, um, how the gospel can make sense of all these sets of challenges that we're afflicted with in the culture that we live in. And I have two main points today. So th this, this message is, is a pretty simple message. We're going to talk about how the gospel helps us understand the transgender revolution and then the gospel helps promote a response to the transgender revolution. But I want to begin by talking about uh, a Time Magazine article that came out in 2016. It was an essay by an author named Jesse Hempel. Um, you might have seen this magazine when it came out. It, hit, it, uh, it was a, a, all the talk in the culture. Uh, it talked about the transgender revolution. And in particular, this author, Jesse Hempel, talked about her brother, Evan, giving birth to a son. Notice that, that sentence might be a little, you had to pay attention there. The opening sentence might catch you, catch you off guard because uh, brothers and men don't give birth. But the Time Magazine article authored by Hempel was asking us to just accept on, on, the, on the face of it that her brother, Evan, had given birth to a son. Uh, the photo that was in the feature story of this Time magazine was designed to elicit great attention um, because in one portion of the article, there appears to be what is a man with a cro close-cropped short haircut uh, breastfeeding a child. So obviously... Men do not have that capacity, but Time Magazine is telling us, here's a man breastfeeding in the pages of Time Magazine, what they call chest feeding. No longer breastfeeding, but chest feeding. So now we have all these new uh, words to describe and how we accommodate the transgender revolution. The story's title was called My Brother's, My Brother's Pregnancy and the Making of a New American Family. And the article was designed to kind of document the brave new frontier that the transgender revolution is promising to bring to America. A frontier that requires all of us to accept the reality that supposedly men can give birth. That's what the article was advancing, that this should not be controversial, that if you believe in the cause of justice, if you believe in enlightenment, if you believe in fairness and equality and compassion, then you ought to accept this new reality that men give birth. Hempel goes on to tell what really is a heart-wrenching story of her brother who had undergone a female-to-male transition at age 19, but who still desired to give birth, and 
and did so at age 35. Uh, the article talks about, there's, there's a sense of lament in this article. Uh, the author talks about how as her brother Evan underwent this transition, the similarities that they once had as being sisters slowly began to fade as Evan took on more masculine appearances. They, at one point, the article talks about how uh, Evan began to grow hair on her knuckles. Um, and so Evan elected not to have her breast removed uh, so that she could still attempt to be a parent divorced from what we would call motherhood. So Hempel goes on to ask a question, I think, that helpfully frames how Christians should possibly be thinking about the transgender revolution. She says this, What if you were born into a female body, know you are a man, and still want to participate in the traditionally exclusive right of womanhood? What kind of man are you then? And that's what I want us to address today. I want us to kind of dig deep into the heart issues behind the transgender revolution. And we have to do this because, as Charles mentioned last night, the pace of the transgender revolution is unlike uh, any other social movement in American history. Uh, the LGB re revolution happened over the last kind of 30 to 40 years, and then the LGBT revolution you can track as happening in the last even five to eight years. So we are accelerating quickly through culture, and a lot of us are caught flat-footed and off guard about how to think about and how to talk about these issues. Uh, as you all know, Facebook offers over 54 plus gender identities to choose from. And so a, a lot of us, as, as platforms like Facebook just accept these types of gender identities, we become accustomed to them, and we just kind of drink that water, we take in that air, and it just becomes a part of normal American life, so that the transgender revolution is no longer a revolution. The transgender revolution is really just transgender reality, given how the media and how the culture has accepted it. And the other thing, too, that makes this particularly difficult for Christians is that uh, we have a hard time responding or objecting to the transgender revolution because it's hard to tell someone that their experience and their personal testimony is wrong because in today's society, we talked about this last night, that autonomy is the chief operating principle of society today. So that what it means to be fully human and fully American is to, is if it feels good, do it. And so we, we mediate our experience and our identities through self-autonomy. And the only sin in America today is to tell someone that his or her perceptions or lifestyle is wrong or sinful. Because we live in a culture where this is how I feel and I was born this way are the ultimate trump cards because if I experience something, the culture says, that must be normative, that must be good. I must accept whatever perceptions and desires are within me. And I'm gonna talk later on about how that's ultimately inconsistent. But we have the culture stacked up against us and we have a movement stacked up against us because the transgender movement is really the fulfillment of self-autonomy run amok. So here's the question we want to ask. How should Christians respond in compassion when people wish to live out the identity they believe will bring them happiness and joy? Because individuals in the transgender revolution or in the transgender movement don't see themselves as, as, as uh, engaging in any type of self-harm or cultural harm. For them, this is just who they are. So how do we respond to them when they just want to be happy? When they just want attempts at joy? So the first point is that the gospel helps us understand the transgender revolution. And 
To do that, I want us to begin by thinking first about how we have a common story in Scripture that underwrites everyone's experience. So we go back in Genesis 1 and 2. What do we see in Genesis 1 and 2? God made Adam and Eve man and woman. And as Denny so rightfully said last night, femaleness and maleness in the Scriptures in Genesis is attached to reproductive capability and reproductive capacity. So we see in Genesis 1 and 2 that in an uncorrupted world, sex or gender follows from sex. Gender and sex are not capable of being severed apart from one another. And I want to be very clear from kind of a, a biblical interpretation perspective that Genesis 1 and 2 is kind of the architectural blueprint that God gave humanity. Uh, we see Jesus in Matthew 19, 4 through 6, reaffirm this Genesis 1 and 2 blueprint. But we all know uh, that we didn't stay in Genesis 1 and 2. So that uncorrupted picture of man and woman living holistically and well and joyfully in their bodies, it did not stay that way. Uh, they sinned, rebellion occurred. Uh, and then disorder resulted. I had Charles read Romans 8, 18 through, 18 through 25 on purpose to start this day off because we have to understand that issues of gender identity conflicts, uh, the choice to take on a transgender identity, these are all effects of living in a Genesis 3 world where we have Roman, Romans 8 groaning going on in creation. So that Paul in Romans 8 is helping us make sense of the futility and the corruption and the decay that God set forth and said what would, that would happen in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve sinned. Genesis 3, 7 says this, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now, I want to pay very close attention to that text. Because we notice that the first result of the first rejection of God by Adam and Eve in Genesis is that people feel ashamed of or awkward in their bodies. Again, the Bible helps us understand and make sense of every single thing going on in the world. Something went wrong between the person's experience of who they are and their body in Genesis 3. Now, this wasn't gender dysphoria per se. Please don't hear me say that Adam and Eve were gender dysphoric. Um, but it does testify to the reality that in a fallen world, one way we know we're in a broken world is that there's a sense of alienation from our bodies. That our bodies testify to the brokenness of creation. That the moment you are born is the moment you begin to die in a Genesis 3 world. In a Genesis 3 world, 32-year-old men like myself go bald. I mean, there's your evidence <laughs> of being subjected to futility. Genesis 3 means that everything went haywire. And in a fallen creation... This is very, I'm going to be very emphatic on this. In a, in a fallen creation, it should be expected that individuals would experience a sense of alienation between their biological sex and their perceived gender. So we should not be surprised about the gender dysphoria experience that we hear some people testify to. The Bible makes sense of the world, again, and the experiences of every person alive in it. Um, in a fallen world, people are going to experience all sorts of different feelings about themselves because, again, we are born broken by sin within our hearts and throughout creation. The scope of redemption that we're, that we're looking to in the future reminds us right now of the scope of our brokenness and creation. So, but I, I want to emphasize also that nothing about experiencing the world through a particular feeling demands that we accept those feelings as normative. So 
the transgender revolution says we experience these perceptions, we experience these stresses and, and conflicts, and because we just experience them, we must act upon them. But that's not a biblical view of how we evaluate our perceptions and our desires, because we always evaluate our perceptions and our desires by what the Bible says. And we look and see if those perceptions of those desires are the result of a Genesis 3 world or whether Genesis 1 and 2 offer us a better and truer roadmap. So people are born with all sorts of afflictions and predispositions that do not produce joy and happiness. So for example, depression. I think one of the great things that has happened uh, in the culture as we've begun talking uh, about depression is the fact that people are more open inside the church about struggles with mental health. Uh, there's less of a stigma attached that if you struggle with depression, churches are now resourcing small groups and leaders to deal with people and to deal with subsets in the church that struggle with depression. But we would all say that depression doesn't, doesn't produce joy and wholeness. But the transgender revolution is asking us to accept that fallen perceptions and fallen desires and fallen mental states are identities to be embraced. That's the equivalent of saying, oh, your depression? Your depression is something that's good. That's an identity. You should, you should accept your depression and embrace that depression. We wouldn't say that to anyone. We would want to say to that person, we're going to walk with you through this season of depression. We're going to pray for you. We'll help you consult medical attention. But we want you to come out of this season of depression. We're not, we don't want to encourage you in that, in that depression. We don't want to tell you that depression is something that's normative and praiseworthy because we want to free you from that. But that's the opposite of what ha it was what's happening with the transgender revolution going on. So whatever we are born with is to be evaluated by the scripture, and the same is true for people who experience gender dysphoria. Um, the sense of gender severed from biological sex is a product of the fall, it is a product of our bodies and our minds not aligning like they would in a sinless world. And we ought to be able to say, one of the, one of the uh, messages of hope that we have to offer is that it was not God's intention from the beginning for human beings to experience self-alienation in this manner. That we actually have hope to offer individuals in this situation. But what we're also seeing is that people are taking extreme measures to bring one's body into alignment, whether by hormone injections or surgical alterations, with one's, with one's gender identity. But what we're also noticing this, is if you go and read the reports, is that that does not solve the deeper issues going on. Individuals who transition, individuals who have surgery, who take injections, in the long run, that does not provide to be a lasting resolve to the deeper struggles going on with these individuals. So one of the things I want us to see is that our hearts are deceived. This is a biblical principle, that our hearts are deceived. 1 Peter 2.11 says this, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. The Bible teaches that inside every person's heart there's a war and that the heart is both the culprit and the victim. And why is that? It's because every person's heart is ravaged by sin. There's an ongoing battle within the heart that wages war with our conscience in order to prevent us from living by God's commands. And sinful hearts manifest themselves in the darkest crevices of human experience uh, because the types of sins that our hearts can concoct are simply infinite. But we all intuitively know that we cannot trust our feelings or all the passions that reside within us just because they occur. Not every impulse we experience should be indulged. Just because I experience covetousness 
doesn't make coveting something to be affirmed. And everybody at their deepest level knows this to be true. Uh, But the challenging aspect right now of our current cultural moment is that society is raging on in debate about whether how and what impulses and desires and perceptions are to be embraced. But the Christian has to say that we are to evaluate all those perceptions and impulses and desires by what the Bible says. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? So the Bible is saying that because our heart is a factory, John Calvin said he's, our, our hearts are uh, idle factories of fallen desires, the Bible instructs us to be suspicious about listening to your hearts. You do you. I, I, hear, I see this on social media a lot. You do you or you be you. That's not a biblical way of looking at who we are as, as human beings. Left to our own devices leads to self-destruction. Because listening to our hearts in a biblical worldview means our hearts are going to lead us astray. And even more, our heart's desires can be at war with what is actually good for us. Because here's why. Because sin's intent is always to deceive. And if we take the Bible at its word, and we should, by the way, um, we ought to be suspicious of what our hearts tell us. Because again, the nature of deception is to convince us that we will not be satisfied unless we indulge what our hearts desire. Um, But we all know that this is not a sustainable worldview. Consider consider envy for a second. Um, Envy, jealousy, uh, envy robs people of joy and contentment. It can sour friendships. Um, It can lead to compromising personal morality just to kind of get ahead. Uh, And we would all say in here that envy does not produce flourishing or joy in people. In fact, indulging envy, if we were to say, hey, you're envious, you be you, indulge that envy. We would say that that would result in misery for others and yourself. But again, sin deceives. So in the moment, the wrath and bitterness of envy satisfies kind of that inner hunger that we have to kind of assuage that anger and that envy. So we cannot just listen and passively endorse and affirm every single thing that comes into our hearts because the Bible says our hearts are fallen. Fallen desires, fallen perceptions. We have to be skeptical about what we feel about ourselves. So what does this have to do with gender dysphoria? Um, In the same way that fallen desires pervade all our hearts, individuals with gender dysphoria can experience real moments of stress about their gender identity. We're very clear on this. These people are having authentic experiences where their heart's desire and their psychological perceptions are telling them one thing about their gender identity while their body is saying something else. But to indulge in a desire or a mental state that would lead to living out of step with one's biological sex is to violate kind of God's will and boundary for creation. And this is because, as Denny said last night, when we look at Genesis 1 and 2, because the Bible's portrait of humanity never severs or disconnects sex and gender. Now, I want to be very clear uh, when I talk about things like this, that I'm not suggesting that individuals who experience gender dysphoria are guilty of more sin than anyone else. Please don't hear me say that. I don't want to heap shame and extra levels of hurt on individuals who are experiencing genuine episodes of distress. Um, But what I am suggesting is that the impulse to live out 
a gender identity at odds with your biological sex is to indulge fallen desires that our heart believes will bring peace. But internal longing for peace does not mean that finding peace is possible if it means violating the boundaries of human limitations. So uh, I I alluded to this a second ago. There have been studies showing that individuals who undergo sex reassignment surgery still report disproportionate rates of unhappiness, of depression, of suicide, and and thoughts of suicide. And we can make sense of this from a Christian worldview uh, because the Bible tells us that embracing an identity, a desire, or perception at odds with the creator's design will never bring ultimate happiness. Living in brokenness will never bring happiness. The passion to live as a member of the opposite sex isn't simply satisfied by surgically altering one's body. These are deeper issues at stake than just exterior, physical, and cosmetic alterations. Uh, Because a man cannot become a woman. A woman cannot become a man. We want to be compassionate when we say that, but we also need to be truthful when we say that. That no amount of surgical alteration can erase what's going on at the cellular and chromosomal level. I also want us to see that our minds are confused. So our hearts are deceived and our minds are confused. Ephesians 4, 17 through 18 says this. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. What Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 4 is that without God in the picture, reason is impaired. And why is that? Because there is futility in our reason because it leaves out the creator in trying to understand the creation and his creatures. Uh, There's kind of a a groping around for answers that cannot be found. Uh, It's like walking around, searching in a dark room for a light switch where there is no light switch. That's what Paul is talking about here in in Ephesians chapter four. Um, And this, again, springs from the fact that our hearts are hardened. Uh, Our hearts are driven by our rejection of God, and so our minds fall prey to the same type of fall as well. Because again, remember, from a biblical, anthropological standpoint, we're we're not just morally neutral creatures here on earth. The Bible defines us and sees us as comprehensively broken individuals. Our hearts are fallen, our minds are fallen, and that reasoning without God leaves us without the full picture of how God created us. And this understanding of the mind is very, very important because the Bible places a priority on the mind because it is the processing center of how change is made in the heart. And because through our mind, we're able to reason and think. And in many ways, the the heart and the mind work in tandem. Um, Our hearts can have a pull or attraction or desire toward one thing, but our mind might know that such attraction or desire should not be acted upon. Um, We often know there's a a large difference between what's going on in our head and our heart. But again, the Bible sees the mind as falling prey to confusion, deception, and rebellion, much in the same way that our hearts and affections are susceptible. Um, And our minds uh, manifest brokenness in any number of ways. Stress, depression, anxiety, self-esteem, Um, Every single one of us in this room struggles with some type of psychological insecurity. We simply do. Um, We know that our emotions and psychological states are volatile and vulnerable. Uh, One moment you can rejoice at seeing your child or your your grandchild playing, and in the next moment 
uh, just be crushed with insecurity about self-worth. That's the nature of living with broken minds, with broken hearts, and a broken creation. And I say all of that because individuals who experience gender dysphoria are experiencing simply a different type of psychological stress than what you or I might experience. Now, it's very, very important to consider that a person who experiences these feelings does not believe that their mind is lying to them because that feeling is very much real. In the same way that someone experiences depression or experiences anxiety, people authentically experience episodes or bouts of gender dysphoria. The question, however, is simple. Should the mind get to determine whether someone is really a member of the opposite sex? And this is one of the controlling factors in the debate, is what has the authority in the gender identity and transgender revolution? Is it personal testimony? Is it biological sex? Is it chromosomes? Is it our anatomy? Is it our brain? Which I want to just emphasize again last night what Denny said about brain sex theory, about the brain in transgender individuals resembling the, the brains of members of the opposite sex that they identify with. That is a hypothesis. That is not a, that is not a fact. Um, and so we ought to leave here confidently knowing that uh, science has not figured this out. But that comes back to the bigger question of how do we determine whether someone is really a member of the, a member of the opposite sex? Does the brain control or do the, do the genes control? And I think what we see in scripture is that our bodies cannot lie to us, but our minds can. Our bodies cannot lie to us, but our minds can. And a person cannot change their personhood or their gender by simply choosing a new identity. This is, we can say this confidently about the Bible because the Bible may not use terms like gender identity or transgender, but the Bible is offering, remember this kind of blueprint architectural roadmap in Genesis 1 and 2, that again that Jesus reaffirms in Matthew 19 about how God made us. And we need to just simply get this out on the table. Um, it is nothing but sheer ideology to believe that a man can become a woman or a woman can become a man. There is nothing to prove that empirically. It cannot be verified. It is based on sheer ideology. It's based on an ideology that says we can change who we are and that gender is on a spectrum. But that's an assertion. It's not provable. The second point is that the gospel shapes the church's response to the transgender revolution. So I want to go back to this person we mentioned in the very beginning, Evan, from the Time Magazine article. And it's very possible that if we do not approach these issues with pastoral sensitivity, that we can uh, hear of a person like Evan's situation and dismiss that with shock and call that person simply crazy or deranged. And we cannot do that. We cannot do that. Instead, we must approach these individuals with both grace and truth. And as a friend of mine reminded me, for some reason, I don't know if this is the case in your mind, but it has been the case in mine. When we talk about Jesus being full of grace and truth, inevitably, we often make grace and truth kind of a balancing test. Are we more grace or are we more truth over here? And I've always done that internally when I've read that passage in John. And a friend of mine, Sam Albury, made the great observation, and maybe this is very plain to you, but grace and truth exist simultaneously in Jesus. It's not an either or. It's not, the scales aren't imbalanced with grace and truth in Jesus. So that means it's possible 
to demonstrate both grace and truth simultaneously. That doesn't mean it's going to be met with warm embrace by the outside world. But, for example, transgender activists argue that dismissing the legitimacy of a person's experience is to just simply dismiss them wholesale. Um, And we should be clear that we are not dismissing the reality that some people experience these sensations or perceptions, but we should have compassion for anyone experiencing distress about a, a perceived misalignment between their gender identity and their body. So not dismissing the reality of these feelings, however, is not the same as affirming those feelings. So we want to say, listen, we understand that you have those feelings. We're going to walk beside you for the long haul and love you through this. But we're not at the same time going to say that these are good feelings. And our culture cannot comprehend that. It's either all or nothing. So again, these individuals who experience gender dysphoria, they're not freaks. Uh, They're not all simply cross-dressers or people desiring to gender bend. Uh, In most cases, uh, their experience cannot be reduced to simply living a lie. In fact, just the opposite is true. People with genuine cases of dysphoria believe it's their biological body that is lying to them. Um, A person in the situation truly believes he or she is a member of the opposite sex. So this is not just something that someone wantonly and brazenly takes up from one day to the next. So there's a level of compassion and empathy that we have to gain. But as Christians, we're also required to confront new challenges with biblical truth. That God made men and women different, um, and that sexual difference does not exist on a continuum where some men are more like women than others and some women are more like men than others. Um, I said this last night that men and women are different at the deepest levels of their being. Our chromosomes are different. Our brains are different. Our voices are different. Our body shapes are different. Body strengths are different. Reproductive systems are different. I could keep going. That's the level and the depth that God has knit difference into all of us. The design for what our bodies are structured and destined for are different, so that God's assignment to be fruitful and multiply only makes sense in light of how God made men and women as capable of fulfilling that call and commission to be fruitful and multiply. So we have to say that because men and women are different, It's philosophically impossible for a man to become a physical woman or a physical woman to become a man. And those who would say otherwise are simply denying human nature. Again, they're making an assertion based on pure ideology. You cannot overcome your biological sex simply because you feel differently than your body. Because our bodies tell the truths of who we are. I like to often say that our psychology cannot change our ontology. So psychology is the study of the mind. Our ontology is a philosophical concept for being. So our psychology cannot change our ontology. But we also want to say that as those who believe that love rejoices in truth... And that truth sets people free, sets people free um, we must state what time and the culture around us won't. If someone was born with two X chromosomes, that person can never be a man. And if a person was born with XY chromosomes, that person can never be a woman. Now, what's really interesting in this Time Magazine article is that the author goes to great lengths. Um, to deny her brother's, or Evan's, innate and inescapable femaleness. And why is this? Because it takes extraordinary effort to suppress how our bodies are designed to function. Um, What's really fascinating is that in order for Evan in this story to give birth, 
Evan had to come off the hormones. And once Evan came off the hormones, what happened? The innate femaleness began to reemerge. So that, remember, God makes us comprehensively different male and female. So that the natural truths of our biology and our design are going to emerge when we live in accordance with how God made us. And no amount of suppression or repression can deny what is true of our bodies. And moreover, suppressing what we know to be true, suppressing the natural design of the body, uh, will never produce the joy that we desire. I was telling Charles this yesterday, what's so sad right now about the sexual reassignment surgical procedure is that it's nothing but politically correct mutilation. Um, we have completely upended the purpose and philosophy of medicine, which the medicine is do no harm and to heal. But because of political correctness and ideology, we are now willing to take healthy anatomy and healthy bodies and to surgically alter them and to thwart their natural function. So our desires, our perceptions, and bodies all testify to the disorder of a sin-ravaged creation. But here's the good news. Whenever we do Christian ethics, whenever we have opportunities to talk about controversial cultural issues, we can never leave the room without bringing it back to the good news. The good news is that the broken bodies we live in all need redemption. Romans 8, earlier that Charles read, says that. And the good news is that in Jesus Christ, all things are promised to be made new. Isaiah 65, Revelation 21. So the state that we're in right now is not a static state. Our bodies, if you're a believer, are on the way to redemption and resurrection. So Christianity doesn't guarantee total relief from gender dysphoria in this life. Um, but it does guarantee future resurrection from our desires, perceptions, and bodies that are subject to death and decay. So that the, the measure of hope that we extend to a dying cancer patient is the same level of hope that we extend to someone who is gender dysphoric. That we don't know if this will go away. But we do know that in Christ, all things will be made new. So what does this require of us as individual Christians? And in short, love. I'm not trying to be trite or cliche or simply uh, simple, but love. Love. Because to be a Christian means to love as you have been loved by God. John 13, verse 34 through 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You, also, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So notice that Jesus says that if we fail to love others, we show that we do not really love God. And when we look at the love that Jesus shows in the Gospels, with examples like the Good Samaritan, that Jesus was indiscriminate with who his love applied to. So that the Good Samaritan, who is your neighbor, Jesus answers that with my neighbor includes anyone and everyone. So that if we are not showing love, that means that we are failing to show that we are followers of Christ. That love is not just an afterthought, that you cannot be a Christian and harbor hatred toward others because love is the foundation of the greatest commandments and that is to love God and love your neighbor. But what does it mean to practically enact this agenda of love? The first thing I would say is that love promotes dignity. Please hear me say that. Love promotes dignity. Genesis 1. He made man and woman in his image. 
That is where we get our doctrine of human dignity. This concept that individuals possess an inviolable worth deserving of honor and respect. So that if someone comes into our church dressed as a woman, when you obviously can tell this person is a man, there's no mockery, there's no dismissal. There's an understanding that we're gonna disagree with this individual, but that person is deserving of respect and dignity. And let me just be very clear. We often hear in the news about episodes of transgender students being bullied or LGBT students being bullied. That cannot be the case for the church. We cannot be those people. We ought to be Risking our, risking our own safety to stand up for the dignity of other people. Um, having dignity is something that cannot be taken from someone because God made every single human being here. That means they have innate dignity that they may try to eradicate by their behavior, but they cannot eradicate because if God made them, they have dignity and no human authority can take it away. And it's when we don't see humans as all equally dignified that all sorts of atrocities and tragedies break out in society. So love requires dignity. And then love requires, or love promotes dignity. And then love requires empathy. And empathy is merely this understanding that people have experiences unlike our own. And because individuals with gender dysphoria are such a small uh, statistical part of the population, it's very, very likely that we're not going to know, we're not going to have in, those, those uh, perceptions ourselves. And so there's going to be a level of empathy that we have to give to individuals who are having seasons or bouts of gender dysphoria. And because empathy is the prerequisite for speaking meaningfully and authoritatively into someone's life. Um, it, it doesn't mean that we accept or affirm or encourage someone to embrace the desire to live contrary to their created gender. It does mean that instead of rejecting a person outright, you take time and make effort to listen to that person. Uh, third, love shares truth. Now, the Bible's definition of love runs contrary to the Western world's definition Um, Because according to the West, loving someone means giving them license to pursue whatever they believe will bring them happiness or fulfillment. But the Bible says that love requires truth. Love does not mean looking someone in the eye and affirming every desire they experience. Love means looking someone in the eyes and communicating the truth of Scripture. But importantly, we do this, like Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, it says, "...with all humility and gentleness and patience." bearing with one another in love. So that if we, we need to work this kind of backwards almost, that if I affirm transgenderism, which is what the culture wants me to do, I am actually doing an unloving thing. Because I am withholding truth because I value my own reputation or my own friendships or my own comforts more than I value the eternal happiness of men and women made in the image of God standing in front of me. Next, love produces compassion. Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. It's very tempting um, when we hear new ideas uh, to feel alarm, especially when they're challenging the Bible. But compassion means that uh, we must disarm and deliberately lay down any negative, ne- negativity we have toward those who think or feel or live in a different way than us. Again, it doesn't mean that we accept or affirm, but it means that we have compassion. And we have to see that love promotes patience. Because a believer who experiences gender dysphoria may never be freed of their gender dysphoria. Or maybe they will. We need to see that patience means entering into someone's pain with confidence that the gentleness and kindness of God is what leads to repentance and not self-righteous correction.
Patience is this understanding that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Um, Because in God's economy, kindness, forbearance, and patience are his instruments. Now, it's really, really important that we pursue love, truth, compassion, and patience, not simply to get a hearing in our culture. Because guess what? You can be as winsome and as kind and as loving as you can possibly be, and that will still get you nowhere in some portions of the culture. The reason that we are compassionate and we promote dignity, that we are loved, that we that we love people, is because these characters replicate who God, these, these character traits replicate who God is. Uh, I, I want to close and simply close by talking a little bit about um, how we often come at this debate. When we talk about the transgender revolution, it's often in the context of bathroom debates, culture wars, uh, seeing things in the newsstands, in the grocery aisle, social media disputes. Um, and we need to be very clear that there is a distinction between the activists out there and the struggling. Because in our minds, because in our minds, everyone's an activist. That's simply not the case. There are lots of people who are strugglers who are not wanting to take on the full transgender identity as who they are, but nonetheless struggle with gender dysphoria. Um, I I think Charles mentioned last night, I have a a book coming out uh, August 15th. And of course I have to plug my book if I'm speaking about it. I mean, let's be honest. It's called God and the Transgender Debate. Um, And the title is a little interesting. It uses the word debate um, because it's really not a debate. This is really about people. Um, And if you know me or if you've known me on social media for the last eight years or something like that, I have tended to be a little bit more of a polemical person, which means I'm really interested in arguments. I'm really interested um, in kind of just sharing my opinion, take it or leave it type of person. And so as I set out to write this book, I set out thinking it would be a pretty polemical book in the sense of, you know, I'm stating what the Bible believes, but there wouldn't necessarily be a lot of compassion or pastoral tones in the book. Um, But after the book was written, and I've sent it out to people to read, uh, it was really fascinating. They came back to me and were like, this is a really, really pastoral book. Uh, and something happened in the middle of the book that I just want to share a little bit about. I was getting to wrap up the book, and my editor, um, he suggested that I look up Matthew 12, verse 20. And this is Jesus in Matthew 12, verse 20. He's taking uh, the ministry of Isaiah and applying it to himself, and he says this, "'A bruised reed he will not break.'" And a smoldering wick he will not quench. And in all of my seminary training, in all of my reading, in all of my schooling, I had never really looked at this metaphor or this imagery of the bruised reed. A bruised reed is uh, like a little, a little plant with a very thin, uh, very delicate Stem, thank you very much. And Jesus is saying that to those individuals who are at their wit's end, to those who feel like they cannot go on any further, that you're burnt out, that you're at the end of your rope, Jesus is saying to those individuals, I'm here for you. He says, a smoldering wick he will not quench, which means Jesus wants to give life. He wants to give life to us as non-gender dysphoric people as much as he wants to give life 
to gender dysphoric people, and he wants to give life to people who are full-on identifying as transgender. But this is Jesus at his, at his most saying, I am gentle. I am like a shepherd. Reading Matthew 12 sent me back into Matthew and reading about in Matthew chapter 9 where he, Jesus looks out on the crowd and he says, they were like a sheep without a shepherd. So we can never, never, never miss out, especially on these hot-button cultural debates that are rightfully so hot-button. I'm not downplaying the significance of these issues. But when we get caught up in them, we cannot let the culture war component be the defining component because there's a bruised reed component and there's a sense of humility and compassion that we all have to have when we talk about an issue that's highly contentious but it's also causing people a lot of personal heartache. And Jesus said this in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28, verse 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word uh, that in an age of millions of voices that your word endures the test of time and provides a straight path. So Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged by your word and that we would be built up by your word. And Lord, um, we do want to pray for individuals who experience gender dysphoria. We pray for uh, whether they're family members or friends of people in this room. Uh, We particularly and specifically pray for their well-being or for their relief Um, and that individuals who are afflicted with any type of mental distress would be able to find a church and a Christian friend to love them. Uh, God, help us to understand that because we live in a Genesis 3 world, we all share in the same brokenness. And Lord, let that be a defining understanding of how we relate to other people in our midst. And God, help us to be agents of love and God, help us to be Uh, kind to bruised reeds. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.